What's the wait for a table for three? Outside, probably about an hour and a half or so. Uh, well, I mean, we met through Jack, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah Jack was like, uh, this guy's coming over. He kills robot or he kills fish. <laughs> <laughs> kills fish with robots. You gotta be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have big updates. Um, you know, we moved to LA, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, did I tell you we hired someone for Andrew? Like yeah, 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 yeah. So even bigger news is yesterday I got a handshake with our new uh, VP engineering, ramping up CTO. Uh, he led a team of ten people at SpaceX for about five years. The guy is so cracked. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So. And that was a big, that was a big pushback from some investors, right? Is like, who's like the technical kind of. Dude, I mean, uh, are you recording? Yes, but we can please. Okay, sure, sure. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, well. Yeah. We're literally like, if you find a technical co-founder of Space Sector Android, I'll give you a round. Damn. So uh, yeah, I moved, I'm staying in Hermosa Beach. Nice. But we got, uh, we work in uh, El Segundo. Oh, uh, cool. Which is apparently like a spot now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so originally, my family is Kashmiri. If you're familiar, it's contested territory in like South Asia. Just did across like Pakistan, India, and China. Me personally, born in Canada, in Toronto, raised in the East. And I moved, moved to the US by myself for college. Um, and then, yeah, I've been here since. No, and then you, you ended up doing YC yourself, right? I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, winter 22. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's You've been at it for a while. What? I've been at it for a while, yeah. I mean, that was when I quit the business first full time. I think we probably should have waited a little bit before we did YC, because I was just like, you know, There's like, figuring out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, we're just trying to build a robot first, you know? But. Hey. Are you wearing Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're right here. Yeah, this is uh, one of the one of the better one of the better tables. Wow, you can even see some of the stars. I know. This is this is peak Malibu. Wow. You can you can see El Segundo from my house. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Oh man. YC. YC, you're going through YC, they're like, bro, you need revenue now. Yeah. Like, just yeah. make the device out of aluminum foil yeah. and sell it to someone. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, there's a point where, like, I was like sitting there on boats doing the technique by hand just to get the. Oh my god! Just to like build a Wait, market. Wait, so explain to the camera why the actual methodology of the machine and all the history of it. Because I mean, should we go from the scrap from the start? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you want to. Because the the idea of like you fucking hand killing all these fish is <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah. All right, gentlemen. Cheers. Cheers, boys. Thanks, Thanks for coming out. No, thank you guys Great for to have you. Excited. If you want to go from the start, um, you know, Nick, I know we talked about it earlier, but yeah, I, I actually say sometimes I was born, uh, you're going to hear some of the spiel again. Uh, yeah. I was born in a seafaring family, so, um, you know, uh, basically grew up on the coast my entire life. You know, my granddad spent time in the Navy. You know, we actually have matching sailor tattoos, so I have an anchor. Uh, on my, on my oh leg. my god, <laughs> yeah, most yeah. cliche. Yeah, it's seriously. But yeah, yeah. actually significant. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah like, one of the only people, was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was super drunk <laughs> yeah. at a bar. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah. a sailor tattoo. Like big mom letters, you know? <laughs> but so I was, uh, I was saying, uh, you know, I was talking about a little bit about my family history. Um, so the first time I went fishing was actually with my dad. And uh, we were sitting, uh, we were sitting, uh, you know, on, on the Red Sea, very idyllic environment, beautiful, like clear, clear water. When you pull a fish out, or you know, you know, your father and son, you're just sitting, he's all holding the same rod. Yeah. You pull a fish out of the water, and like the natural thing for the fish is to start flopping around, and my dad just throws it in a bucket of ice. Doesn't really think about it, right? But so like two hours later, like literally two hours later, when we land at the dock and we open yeah. the bucket, the fish is still alive. Oh, There's wild. like blood everywhere around the corners, this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um. So, I, I was like four at the time, I wasn't quite sentient enough to really understand, like, you know, why that was a problem. <laughs> you know, but, 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 uh, the, um, but, you know, so fast forward, like, so, you guys know, I uh, immigrated to the U.S. when I was 18 by myself, you know, so I went to work for undergrad, you know, as I told you, I was like, in my entire high school, it was like building Tesla coils, working on small engineering projects, but more on like the electrical and hardware side. Yeah. I didn't really love software because they didn't feel tangible to me. Yeah. And so Wharton was actually the only business school I applied to. I kind of applied everywhere else for engineering and got into some great schools, but went to Penn campus, felt right, wanted to be there, so I went. But halfway through, I kind of realized that my brain was like atrophying from, <laughs> from yeah. the lack of like a technical education. And so, um, 
you know, uh, decided to tack on a master's in physics and uh, light work. Yeah, it was it, it was much lighter than doing a second bachelor's because like that would have been like thirty extra degrees, whereas uh, thirty extra classes. But instead, I only needed to do a uh, like a set of eight. I think it was. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, but like it's like four graduate classes and four undergrad. Did you do that in a year? Uh, I started my junior year and then I just did overtime and then I spent oh. an extra semester. Yeah. So you started before you'd actually finished undergrad. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Smart. Um. Yeah, and then, so I wanted to go to grad school in computer science, uh, in, specifically in computer vision, and I found a professor that I wanted to take me on, and so I went to CMU for summer, to kind of ramp up into the grad school program, Yeah. and um, did not realize, you know, academia is not for me, <laughs> but, <laughs> but while I was there, you know, as part of the professor, you know, working with the professor in one of my early mornings, there was an essay in the newspaper on uh, if fish could scream. Wow. It was all about how, because fish don't have vocal cords, we give them less empathy than land animals, and yeah. most pertinent was end of life experience. So, like, most fish today, actually, what was happening when I was four years old as a kid was that microcosm what happens in the industry. So, yeah. when you walk into Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or any mass market retailer, most fish basically suffocate to death. Yeah. And... The knock-on effects of suffocation, you know, and... The tension the of, like... That stress, you know? Yeah, yeah. The stress, Personal hormones. hormone release. Exactly. Yeah. All the, I mean, in the same way for humans, it kind of wrecks your body. It kind of, it's same dying, thing for fish. Dying yeah. wrecks your body, <laughs> yeah. by the way. Do not die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and um, I mean, there's a few different acts. Like, there's the, the kind of, like, mental portion of it, which is, like, this cortisol and, like, adrenaline analog with release of, like, chemicals. Um, and then there's, like, the lactic acid from the muscles being tense. Yeah. And all those things basically contribute to a more acidic environment yeah. that in turn creates more bacterial growth wow. and in turn rapidly speeds the decay of shelf life of water. And so for us, well, at the time, I actually first wanted to work on a project on uh, how might fish express pain. <laughs> more like it was like an art project and you know we were thinking like oh could I put like a sensor on the skin of a fish and convert that into like a signal but then convert into a loudspeaker for like a human scream yeah and it was kind of supposed to like bridge empathy I did some cool projects in, uh, in college kind of like that that I'm happy to talk about but that was kind of like the, the crux of it but while I was looking around I found the techniques that were automated today and, and thought why not solve the problem directly so yeah. in contrast to the, uh, the suffocation Japan has a technique that's very similar to kosher slaughter, but yeah. instead of for cattle, it's for fish. And so it's a traditional Japanese technique. It's gone back for like centuries, very old. And the uh, um, technique basically consists of stopping experience of stress and bleeding the animal so that you stop any of those like decaying effects. So the way that they do that is they spike the fish in the brain the second yeah. it comes out of the water, so it never has to flop around for two hours, whatever. And then after it dies, the gill, you, you take a blade and like cut the gills. And the heart is actually, even for any animal, after they lose consciousness, the heart's normally still active. And so the blood will actually naturally pump out. And so you actually remove the blood, it's called exsanguination, you remove the blood from the carcass. Yeah. And so in turn, you basically have a less acidic environment because there's no stress. Yeah. And you have no blood to any bacteria that do grow, they starved out. And in turn, the meat, instead of rotting, it actually starts to dry age. And so that you actually get much longer shelf life, you get better quality, it's better for human digestion, you have better nutrition, all these things that rapidly compound over time. It actually gets better instead of worse at time. And in turn, you have this, uh, uh, how would I even describe it? Um, it's quite literally like a different product and in turn requires a different supply chain. Yeah. And so, you know... And just to be clear, what, what ultimately the difference between sushi-grade salmon and, you know, regular salmon is the way in which it's killed, right? It's not necessarily the fish itself, right? So, yes. There's few... There's more, more do you want to just yes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Fish are not necessarily... They don't need to be EKG made to be sushi-grade. Yeah. But in turn, the fish that have better sushi grade go bad like this, or they're really like not great for health. Yeah, for eating them. 
a, a lot of different factors into this, and like it's kind of hot take for me to be saying that in the first place. Yeah. But really, you know, in Japan, every single pound of fish, almost every single pound, is EKG made. Like there's a, there's one, like a, for example, I'll give you the science of scale. There's a company ca uh, called True World Seafood, and they import sushi like high-end sushi fish from Japan here to the U.S. They make 400 million a year just doing distribution. Huge company. They're processing, you know, moving, you know, like an insane amount of volume. So it's Shinke, we're basically automating that Japanese uh, slaughter technique to produce longer lasting, better fi tasting fish at scale. So, um, where was I? Um, You're trying to get full serving. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, you know, I found the techniques when I was working on that project and I thought, you know, it was very simple to me, why not solve the problem directly? So I, you know, as part of like how I found the technique, I literally Googled, or you, on YouTube actually, it's on YouTube. Uh, I searched on YouTube, how to kill a fish. And the first YouTube video was this Vox video, 12 million views about EKG Me, which is the technique. And the guy who did it is this guy who runs the EKG Me Federation, so he, his name's Andrew the, the Global Federation. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> the, uh, He's like the man. Galactic Federation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... Did you get him to invest, by the way? He's an advisor. No way. Yeah. <laughs> been, yeah, he's been working with, he is like our, the, the first advisor. And, after me, the first shareholder should get. Um, he, uh, so, so yeah, he has a website called Ikijime Federation. It's basically, um, it's a way for fishermen to buy Ikijime gear. But that's just his side hustle. He's actually a full-time, uh, like, uh, he's a full-time partner at a law firm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's a commercial fisherman when he was younger. And then, like, now Dude, there's, like, a health, healthcare law and, like, lobbying and all this stuff. And so he's working with the uh, FDA to, like, redo fish handling laws and then kind of give, like, a basis for things like Ikijime to have a legal presence here yeah, in the U.S. So it'd be, like, organic. Effectively. Equivalent, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, like, Ragu is a label, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so... So I literally just like sent Andrew a cold email, and I was like, "Hey, like, uh, I even I, I, I love the way you kill fish." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, um, and something along the lines of, uh, "Saw your video. I want to automate the technique. Have you seen anybody make robots to do this?" And he was like, "You know, no one's really doing it. There's like one mechanical machine that works for like the factory farm salmon in Norway. That's kind of like 18 generations and like somewhat." I'm not gonna say genetically modified, but it's almost quite that. Uh, and and they're, um, they have basically identical genetics. And like because of that, right. the entire premise of like why this at scale has not been applied is like fish have a lot of variation in size, shape, contour, color. It's yeah. really difficult to build machinery that can account for that variation at scale. And so for us, what we do is we have this layer of computer vision that goes on top of the you know machine. the entire machine that guides these cuts in real time, right? And so you have to reach this industrial speed that's like, you know, a thousand fish plus an hour at the same time while like skin making everything like surgical accuracy. And so yeah, Andrew is like, look, the only thing that kind of exists is this one machine that works for fish's fixed size and shape. And so let's hop on a call. And he calls me on his weekend wearing like a rip curl t-shirt and it's like fisherman thing on his boat. And he's like, you know, we should work on this together. You should do this. I reached out to a bunch of other NGOs, um, and they're all super excited, and they've, you know, they've given us grants. And, you know, uh, I got conviction to do it full time. That's yeah. wild. I gave Jared, I worked on it for, for you know, a few months. Gave Jared Friedman at YC a cold email, and the rest is history. <laughs> so YC was your first money in? YC is my first money in. Um, we took some, like, smaller, like, student fund money and things like that, but, like, YC was the first institutional investor. Yeah. And then this this round this round that's just come together. I don't know when you're going to announce it, so we don't have to talk details. Yeah, probably not but, for a while. But yeah, yeah. But um, and don't worry, we get 350 views a video, so <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Uh, it's, we can announce whatever we want here. <laughs> um, you'll probably get some some inbound, but um, uh, but this I feel like is a massively validating moment because you go from like you know backed by like YC, which they'll hard to get in but they'll kind of fund just a really smart person to like all right this is a real business you know opportunity here i mean you know i would say like you know and nick i'll i'll, I'll put this whatever you want to include in this next step for uh to your editing judgment but it, frankly it was a really big slog like i do think um 
there is something to be said about these traditional industries where you br bring like really highly intelligent people to look at these industries from the ground up and rebuild the supply chains. Yeah. And then I think it's a win-win for everybody when that happens. Fishing is a really hard industry to do that because there's so much insulation around the information. Yeah. You know, and we can talk about why. It's not necessarily the things you want to publicize that you know. Um, but the long and short of it, a lot of fraud, a lot of like intentional, ne you know, nebulous, you know, discussions and conversations and numbers for the sake of creating confusion so that in that confusion, like, no one has to be precise, you know? And, so, and is it market manipulation in terms of pricing and stuff as well? Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so my first probably, like, we had good progress, but not great in terms of, like, slope. Yeah. For our first, like, year and three months. And then, like, in March, it kind of, like, all unlocked once we had, like, we launched this, like, new version of the robot that was higher speed. That got us a lot more credibility until I started talking to more farms and, you know, we started getting to, like, great restaurants. So we're sitting at Nobu here in Malibu. And <laughs> um, we, uh, Shinke, actually, through, through our client and, like, our, one of our distributors who's an advisor, we, we do all the salmon for Nobu in New York and all the, no the Nobus. We so also do that's the biggest logo. If you want to raise from VCs, yeah. <laughs> have no, exactly. have no, no as a logo. We also have 16 other Michelin star restaurants through our distributors that at some point or the other will get the fish. We, um, are, uh, through our client, are also expanding to retail. And, you know, so it's just like really validating to start seeing that the benefits are cascading across the entire supply chain. So that was an inflection point? Yeah, so that unlocked, that deployed. At the same time, I had this really large conglomerate reach out to me. Um, who we're now working with, um, I'm not going to say because we're still in the technical feasibility stage, but the conglomerate owns over like almost half of the entire quota for a very famous species, it's a household name, and they make over $3 billion a year, huge company, and we're working with them already, we have stuff on their cameras and their boats on like, uh, pure software projects as well, yeah. it's kind of independent of the Ikijime robots. But that those two things happening of like, hey, we have this really complex robot that's like very dexterous and the, the type of automation it's doing. We've yeah. already proven we can build that type of automation and do it. And then we also have this really high margin software product that we're deploying as part of the processing stack. Yeah. It created a lot of credibility for us. Yeah. And that in turn helped us get customer traction, got people excited. And then, you know, I just experienced a lot of personal growth too, you know? <laughs> you know, like, I'm a different person. Um, and uh, I think, like, you know, since that March, I spent, like, for example, I spent, like, four weeks in Bangkok with literally the producer of one in every four cans of tuna. They own Red Lobster, they own Chicken Sea, they own John West, and you know, they already see what we're doing. We're the only people really working on a proper humane slaughter. And here's here's a stat that was eye-opening to me, uh, straight from the deck, but like three billion people on Earth rely on fish as their primary protein. So they're like, you know, the whole world doesn't eat that much protein, right? But like, if it's your primary protein source, that's insane volume. Yeah, we have to think like, middle class in Asia, Right, that's Salivating. rising and growing exponentially. Thank you. Thank you. Scandinavia, Scandinavia, where it's a large part of the diet. South America. Most people don't know this. After Norway, Chile is the second largest salmon producing well, country I think in the world. Nobu, the first Nobu was in Peru. Really? Potentially? There you go. We confirm that. Well, he did say it was Peruvian mix, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Nobu's first restaurant was he was in Japan. Somebody pitched him on doing a restaurant in Lima, Peru, mm. and so he created the restaurant there. Cool. And that was like his. It wasn't called Nobu at the time, but that ultimately became the menu that we're having today. And so that's why you have the Peruvian influence, or whatever. Um, what do you think of the Amishu? What? What do you think of the Amishu? Uh, no, I, li I like it. I mean, I normally don't. Uh, I don't tend to have like sweet cocktails but this is nice it's nice because i i'm not inclined to like just rip through it oh yeah like <laughs> you still got some, some working on i'm working on it yeah <laughs> what do you think nick it's good yeah what do you think about nobu what do you think about being under the moonlight with yeah your boys? yeah yeah literally i i cannot believe you can see the stars here that's like in new york that would be that would never happen yeah no the visibility in malibu is wild and you actually from where i live there's you see all the light pollution blasting up from LA, but it goes like out this way. So you just see it's like almost like, a, what is it, the green lights, you know? Uh, the northern lights. Anyways, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground.
I mean, we can keep going. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, this keep would... pitching. Keep. <laughs> <laughs> keep never, never stop selling. Always be pitching. Yeah, yeah. Um. Man, tell me, curious. tell me about like. You obviously another catalyst this year is like every VC realized that it's actually cool to invest in like hard to build like deep tech companies, right? And I don't know if like. Shinke is not necessarily, it's like a robotics company more than it is like true deep tech, right? Because you're taking like technologies that have already been proving and you're reapplying them in like a niche industry. Yep. Um, but there's this massive wave of people being like, all right, I want to invest in hard companies. I want to invest in robotics. I want to invest in AI. And so like you've had some of that, but there has to be a ton of VCs that are like, I like you. I kind of like what you're going after. I just can't really even start to like de-risk this basically right because it's a weird industry yeah yeah it's like how do, i'm not gonna like call up my buddy that has like a big he has like a fleet of fishing boats i, I right? would say like 90 percent of like the investors we have right now are just pure founder bet yeah yeah i think i think so you know i think people bet i think people like where what how much we de risk i think that kind of points to like my capability as a founder in terms yeah. of you know for we've raised very little capital now they now now you're after you did all the heavy lifting to get here now you're bringing in the heavy hitter new hires yeah exactly and but, yeah i mean but you wouldn't have been able to get them if you didn't make all that progress it's all chicken egg you know it's like i have to make all the progress to get people to understand hey i actually can turn capital into like a real world business and then then those people will be believing me and vouching for me then it excites the top talent those, then that top talent then wants to come here, and now we have like you know people, you know SpaceX. We have literally one of the, you know one of the first employees at Andrew. You know we have literally like the guy who was there when there was a napkin sketch of like Andrew's first product investing. You know like it's like we're, I'm, um, I think that goes a long way, um, and more so you know, start satisfying client needs and getting real real things served to real people, right? Yeah. That's that's the biggest thing I think between a lot of deep tech companies will like get trapped in the cycle of like this thing of like you know the like narrative cycle of like building more better and better and better prototypes. Yeah, but yeah, never yeah, actually yeah. build something that customers commercial. want. Yeah, yeah. Commercial. Whereas most like, people would be in your shoes raising having raised trying to raise their next round having not ever served the end product to anyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean look we I mean we have you know if anyone wants to go to Nobu and try out, just you know, you get their normal salmon. That's the the coho salmon from local coho in upstate New York, and one of our robots is there. And you know, we've literally been able to like multiply the shelf life. We have much better quality. You know, the, the distribu distributors are calling us out, being like, we want all our farms to be using this because they're the ones. Yeah. You know, the entire it's a, you're literally running a different supply chain when you do this, yeah. right? You know, the fish last you know exceptionally long. And for everybody who takes logistics risk, it's just a much better situation. <laughs> yeah, Every exactly. on a fi so that's like kind of on a macro level. And then on a fish by fish basis, you actually, when any animal dies, including the humans, and they're frozen, you know, so cattle, you know, or cattle, poultry, whatever it is, the when it's frozen, the water crystals inside the cells expands and tears the cell membrane. And then when it's thawed, all that water leaches out. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. that's all water weight that's lost as revenue because it's on a per pound basis. Oh, wow. And so, you know, in beef, it's like nothing, it's like 3%. But in fish, it can be as high as 10, and in like really, really special cases, it's as high as 30. Yeah, yeah. Um, most of the time, it's around the 10%. Yeah. But that's all like lost revenue. And for a company yeah. that's doing like hundreds of millions of pounds of fish every year, that's a lot of money. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Because um, it literally can, ta tangibly, all that money goes straight to the bottom line, right? Yeah, I feel like what's 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 really exciting for me to witness is like even your confidence. This conversation versus even like two months ago, or whatever, six Dude, weeks ago. We like saw you're we, on, we, six you're on weeks, a different. Six weeks. Yeah, I feel you know, and I, I'd prefer not to share this, but I'm just being honest with you. Like, I think having like Cantos like blessing. Yeah, and in turn, like Jack and you and like all the other angels are getting so excited. Has like, you know, I I would say I. You know, you've been like thinking like, am I fucking crazy? Like, yeah, in, yeah, just, I, like in the, <laughs> like just just in the pit, just grinding. Yeah, it, you know, it was it's one of these things where it's so isolating. Like, I I I was in New York where there's no other deep tech founders. I am in an industry where like no one really knows anything, and it was it was it was fairly isolating to be honest about like, you know being in a situation where you know also i feel like when you're building something that's completely novel 
of trying to change an existing industry, you're like every meeting you have with people that know a lot about the industry, you're almost like worried that they're going to tell you like, oh, this isn't going to work because of this thing. And then you do it enough, and then you get you break through those those conversations enough, yeah. and then you actually get the product working, producing product that real people are consuming. And then you're like, no, this is fucking possible. Yeah. And now the only thing that stands between me and like making that happen is just purely resources, right? Yeah, um, and I mean, it's this incredible transition to go through where I like would pull up a call as a fisherman and not know shit about fish. And I'd be like, yeah, you should try out robot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, so part of that was I actually worked as a deckhand for, for a bit to really get that exposure That's into awesome. the industry and like learn what it's like to be a fisherman. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was a slog, but it, I mean, dude, past like two, like, Eight weeks ago, it was a completely different company. We had like you know no ran clothes, no lead. We had very few tier ones excited. We had um, you know our talent was like strong, but not as strong as it is today. And we're um, and like now, I just feel like literally it's it just kind of feels inevitable, you know, yeah. in a way that like it didn't quite before. And I think there a lot, you know, I had a lot, still a lot of runway left even before you know we closed the round. But I think there's a lot in my personal. Um, mind going of like oh should I return the money you know, this and that and that's not necessarily like something I never do but it was just this feeling of like hey I don't want to be that guy it's like it was pressure yeah that's really what it was it's like uh, you know we were in the unlock I, I mean already just with this credibility you've seen what I can do with just like you know as able yeah, to hire yeah. early old, and the real person able to hire like you know um, SpaceX. SpaceX you know we have a ton of SpaceX people that I'm turning down now you know like I literally we had a we had a uh, found our interview nah, this guy the, you're like the bars here yeah like, I mean we literally we literally like 10 extra bar like within eight weeks and it was it's was pretty magical that's so thing. key because the team's still small enough that that becomes like that's yeah. like the average now yeah, yeah and I mean it's so it, important for getting those next new hires it's all momentum you know like I think it's like you know I think a lot of like company building is like or, uh, social organism design. Yeah. You know, we were thinking about like how are people going to interact, and what's like the metabolisms, what's the engineering metabolism, how's the process of like creating yeah. new, new work, sales, things like that. And so, if you're building this organism, the most important thing that matters is the gene pool yeah. to start, right? Because you're not going to have control because of, there's like nature and nurture. The only thing you have control over right now is like the the nature, because nurture will just happen to you, and you sorry, uh, nature will happen to you. And you can't control that. Yeah. And so, in turn, what that means in, in translating to business context is. You're gonna have, we're gonna go through a shit ton of stuff we're gonna learn about. We're all gonna go through personal growth. We're gonna be different people. We're gonna learn a lot about industry, we're gonna learn a lot about ourselves, the processes, how to do great engineering work. And the only thing that's gonna like, mani- like ma- how it's gonna manifest is like a different company with certain processes in place. And yeah. all, the only thing we can then control, if we have this like, we have this um, evolution factor yeah. that every company goes through from the gene pool into the, you know, yeah. the, that time gate. If you have that evolution factor, the only thing, you know, all I can control is who's going to be with me when yeah. we go through that. Yeah. And that was the most important thing, you know. And yeah. So having folks like, um, uh, you know, having folks like Reed, who's like the space tech guy, like, yeah. I, you know, I, it's funny, you know, I, I'm a solo founder, I will be permanently now, but, you know, there's a time when I consider bringing on a co-founder um, for some things we discussed earlier, as well as, you know, uh, I just think that while I do have technical background, I think my real like zone of genius comes at like vision setting and like really big picture sales with really large articulating companies. Articulating the opportunity in a bunch of different ways. Exactly. Right? And just getting people excited, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, and I just think I'd never, I'd never had met someone who I was just so excited and like I felt like I actually had met someone who was equally competent in a skill set that was... Um, complimentary to mine until I met Reed Ginsburg and Reed is like you know um, hopefully signs the next Love 24 hours fish yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually he's never fished at all but <laughs> dude it was, it's one of the things, I was like looking for co-founders for forever I, you know and Reed um, we got introduced through a really close friend of mine and I started talking we working together and we really hit it off but like he was kind of going you know got engaged was going through this life transition so you know I was talking to all these phenomenal people who've been in SpaceX for years and years and years and then I, I hit up Reed again, and I was like, hey, Reed, like, you know, we'd love to get your thoughts on some of these people I'm talking to. And I sit there, and, it, you know, it was the first, one of my first times being in person. And, you know, it just, it was just, just like, you know, my, my, the universe was, like, speaking through me. And I was like, you know, I was talking to him and sitting there, and I was like, 
talking about all these people, and he was the one I wanted, you know? And, and so the next day I was supposed to fly so you're out. like talking with your crush. Dude, I mean, they're literally. Like, and, like, and so I went home and I called my friend who'd introduced us way back when, and I was like, dude, like, I was talking to all these people, but I was like, I want him. And he was like, this is the same moment as in the rom com when you're like sitting yeah. there, and it's like the girl's like, oh, does he like me? And the guy's like, oh, does she like me? And, you know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I, I was like, I hit him with the text, and I was like, dude, like, hey, um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm gonna be back in Orange County tomorrow, like, let's talk. And uh, I push out my flight, you know, it's just a full on rom com. I push out my, he doesn't even know this, I think. But I was like, I, actually, I did tell him at the time. I was like, I pushed off my flight. I, um, I need to see him. I need to see. I need to see him. I need to tell him. And I just, I risked him so hard. And, you know, um, you risked him? Dude, I, I, I brought all the risks, dude. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, like, and, like, it just, it felt right. And he's joining now, you know? And, Amazing. uh, uh, you know, we went through some hiccups about like when it's the right time, and then we raised, and then now he's not getting the same. Uh, he's not getting equal equity, me, you know, which is what we talked about before. But um, it's fair though. You, that's why founders get outsized compensation when exactly. it works. But I'm excited for you to meet him because he's where is he? So, so he's gonna be in. That's a good Yeah, he lives in Santa Monica. Yeah. I was thinking of bringing him. We should like, come by and like we should actually when you guys are ready to share more, like we'll do a video of like I want to throw some fish down. Yeah, let's get, let's get on a boat. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, I want to I want to eat a fish like a. Yeah, I do some more on my, my phone. I want to eat a fish like an apple that just came out of your machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a little dark. So who built the machine up to this point? Yeah, we have a great technical team. Um, like, you know. You had the idea, right? Yep. So how did you build the machine which then you sold, right, to raise money? I mean, you raised pre, pre product, right, mm -hmm. from YC? We had prototypes. Okay. But it was like, I had like a 3D printer with like a nail stuck to the end of it. <laughs> and that was like my prototype. And like, Tell me about that process. I mean, so I built that. That was like open source computer vision on like a plastic fish. And then I literally just like found a nail. I taped it to the end of a 3D printer, and I was like, this is how it would work. Yeah. And that got the initial money, the initial prototyping, and then, you know, over time, you start building more and more investor conviction, you know? So, here we are. You know, I'm curious from your side and the investor side, like, on the investor side, when you guys were all talking to each other, like talking to Jack and things like that, like, what do you, what do you think got you guys so excited so, I mean, a bunch of things. Obviously, uh, founder bet in that, like, I think you're highly charismatic, uh, well-spoken, very convincing around different things, but also understanding that it's really fucking hard and not like, oh, like, some founders go into things and they're so confident they think something's gonna be easy. Like, you have that balance of like, what we're doing is really hard and it's gonna be really hard to do, but we're confident because basically anything, it, it's all sort of been done in sort of, I guess, like other industries, right? And you're just applying it in a new way. Mm -hmm. Not not saying all of it, but, but I just mean like, you're creating a novel product for the fishing industry and like fish processing. Um, and then I think the market was obviously big. Like I think that like if, if you can build the device that I now believe you can build, that it will be like a massive, massive, massive opportunity, right? Like multi-billion dollar business just within fish, fish like processing, right? Um, so I think like, if you're doing something really hard, you need to make sure that if you actually pull that off, that you're gonna get paid like really well for it. Um, and then I think, the, you know, the other thing was like taking a concept that's like, it's, uh, I love, businesses where you can take something that like is objectively boring like processing fish is boring you know people love to eat fish they're not like waking up in the morning being like thinking about processing fish right except for you dude <laughs> you and the team <laughs> exactly. um, speak for yourself <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, no but I think you did a really good job like taking something that is like not boring. a yeah boring and like you know I think the, the brand old legacy <laughs> yeah legacy yeah. industry but then um making, I think the way that you presented all the information was compelling and I think that's so key for customers, for 
uh, potential hires, things like that, um, and investors too. Like, yeah, but most because I mean, because I don't have any other bets in in uh, fish processing. Fish processing. <laughs> yeah. I'm now trying to make a or portfolio. Food in general. I mean, I'm gonna raise a rolling fund just for, for fish, fish processing. <laughs> but um, if you really think about it, like. You know, I mean, first of all, on a day-to-day basis, everyone loves getting presented a fillet of fish. No one has any idea how much work goes yeah. into converting that fish. Not even catching it, but converting it from something that's been caught into something that's ready yeah. for you to eat. It's a well, lot I've gone of fishing labor. off of this coast, and yeah. uh, it's, it, it makes me appreciate like how it makes Nobu feel like really cheap for what it is, right? Like the fact that like Dude, the amount you can of go out for 14 hours, not get anything, come back, and have spent like. Um, you know, you could have spent six hundred dollars on gas, and you spent all this time <laughs> on the water. It's insane. And, like, have nothing to show for it. Right? Yeah. Dude, I, get, I remember you. when I was a deckhand, we actually got caught in a tropical storm that came up from Mexico. It's like the remnants. And first of all, that was insane in life experience. I will share it. I was sure. I sent you a video. Audio. All right, and we're gonna tag a little video of me getting caught in a storm <laughs> in the corner yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. You know, I got so I got caught in this tropical storm, and the thing about it is, when the weather is shitty, you cannot catch fish. It's so hard, and yeah. so it's like not only is the weather shitty, but you're also like not catching Monetizing anything. Monetizing your time. Yeah. yeah. So you go back home, and like I remember, you like went home, and we had like three fish, and there's like four of us working as deckhand, like or four deck, like three deckhands and a skipper. It was like a full. So um, that was like barely enough food for the for the squad. No, we wouldn't even feed ourselves. It was insane. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite the experience. But, you know, I think the thing that people really resonate with is, you know, first of all, you look at a co- companies like Anduril, and, like, when they first start, they're really, like, non-consensus. And well, this was the example that I, well, so, so on the yeah, topic exactly. of, yeah, like, yeah, non, like, non-sexy industries and making them cool, like, yeah. if you told somebody before Stripe came around, like, oh, I'm, cre- like, payment, I mean, I'm building a payment processing startup, they'd, like, would not have given a shit. Their eyes would have glazed over and they would have been like, oh, like, that's cool. Like, and then they're going to go talk to the next person or whatever. Like, it's just really not, maybe an SF, right? One place, but Stripe managed to make payment processing, like, cool, right? And I think that um, it's possible to do that literally in every industry. Like, Anderol made death machines, like, cool, yeah. where people are like, yeah, I want to go work for the death machine company. And that, um, that was a big confidence unlock for me, by the way, because I was just, the way that you guys put it was like, Yeah, really because I, I was like, yeah, you're basically, like, it's Anderol for food processing, or, you know, I think that's, like, the best way that I can think to, like, sum up what you're doing, because it's not just about fish. If you do fish, like, you can do a lot of other things. You can use, like, a... Like an end to te- technological advancement. Like you're obviously optimizing the sourcing of seafood and the humane slaughtering of it. And you're cannibalizing the industry by doing so. Like the, the traditional way of, of how it's been. You're gonna get me killed if you say that, dude. <laughs> you're gonna get me killed if you say that. The fish is still run by the mafia. <laughs> like, but yes, I agree. Like on a philosophical level, is there an end to it where we reach some sort of society where we've we've actually figured out the most optimal way to source fish? And I think you should think there's no it. end of history in fish. Well, I, I mean, if they figure out what's like the actual question we're answering, right? Yeah. Like, really, if they, like there's like three or four other levels on top of like going even more first principles on that. You have to yeah. think like fundamentally, I think it all comes down to human fuel. Right, and energy, right? Like, where do you like the eight billion people in the world get their, their calories from, and like, why did they do that, right? And then you can even, you can even go back all the way to the start about like what's our thermodynamic purpose, but like let's like not go that. Like, that's good so for today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Need some more LSD for that. One. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, the you know the, we talked about social organism organism design, right, with companies. I think the the same way that cells become tissues and tissues become organs and organs become humans. Humans also become social organisms, we just don't call them that. We call them companies or countries or empires. And then, you know, if you really think about it, right, like on any indefinite time scale, like not like 10 years or 15 years, right? Most of the BS that like these defense companies, I say that, you watch me, why? But most of the, the, the uh, most of the defense companies are working on things that will not matter in 20 years, right? Because technology will just rapidly uh, improve. What does matter is who are those people who are actually making that technical progress, right? And so, for example, if you have an IQ, like if the Chinese average IQ is like 10 points higher than the US, yes, maybe in the next 10 years is gonna matter, like what technical difference we have right now, but in 50 and 100, it's not gonna matter. What 
these social organisms compete on at scale, these empires, is the quality of their gene pool. And yeah. so there's three three there's exogenous, endogenous, and endogenous factors that within one lifetime you can improve your genetic quality and uh, endogenously, like internally, is the air you breathe, the water you're drinking, the food that you eat. Yeah. And so I want to spend the rest of my life working on food, and Shinkei is just kind of like one step in that. I got water locked. <laughs> well, there you go, yeah. <laughs> and we, um... Augustus? No, Where actually. Uh, but Augustus, oh, you're, Augustus, your project, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I have Rora, yeah. which I started with some friends, Brian and Charlie, which is mm. consumer water filtration products. Yeah. We're launching... Um, Dude, Summer clean water is so hard to find in the U.S. Yeah, it's I know. so expensive. I know. And it's crazy. Yeah. Like I, I, like I'm sure like 90 percent of the, you know, um, in high school for contrast, you know, when I had just like normal clean water from the spring, I was like going to <laughs> from like the spring. from the spring. It's like international math competitions in like Vienna and like all, like all these like crazy things. I come here and like the same math I was doing in like my sophomore year, I like could not do. Because it was so like really? my brain, my, water. No, um, well, I mean, it's not just water; it's food yeah, just as much. Just well, well yeah. this is the point I'm trying to make, which is like the food system here is so uh, at the core; it's so flawed yeah. because the way that it was designed was top down and not bottoms up. You know, it was we have X number of people; we, they need Y number of calories per day. They need it. I think the average, the average, there's like more than 350 million burgers consumed a day in America. Right. I believe that's the stat. That's insane. Let me look at it. But yeah, and then and then, <laughs> okay. Augustus turned me on to a business in the groundwater uh, production and management space that um, then I put together a deal to buy. Um, oh, you bought the, the, the startup yet? Uh, yeah, he was involved. In that, yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, so yeah, I've been heavily, heavily uh, focused on water. Uh, cool. Well. You know, I think the, the example I like to give in contrast to the U.S., I think, you know, actually, before I, I get to that point, so there's many countries, I think, exemplify, like, a kind of different POV to the U.S., where they go bottoms up, right, of, like, how do we feed one person really effectively and then scale that, right? And that, I think, to an extent, I think Israel does that, so, I think uh, a lot of actually like Gulf countries do that, like Saudi Arabia, UAE, you know, and just why, you know, a lot of them we call it broad shouldered, whatever have you. Um, the, um, and so the intention, and, and so I think Japan out of all of them has the most star contrast. So Japan, a lot of the industrial food systems are based off of, instead of like going top down about how to make this volume of food, is how do we scale these smaller, more artisanal systems in a way that will sustain our population's health as the population grows yeah. without you know, without losing out that heritage that we have as yeah. well as our human human health. And in turn, what you have over like 80 year time period in, co in contrast is the Japanese have, I think it's like anywhere from like three to six points, depending on who you ask, three to six points average higher IQ. They have almost the same number of centennials as the U.S. with a fraction of the population. And really the only difference to why Japan is not a such a superpower versus the U.S. is software rather than hardware. It's cultural, but that's an exogenous factor, not really what we're talking yeah. about, right? So there are other factors that are at play. But if you really look at the pen to paper, there are pretty substantial differences across populations. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I think when I look at like where the world's headed, in a hundred years, I get really scared about where Silicon Valley, where all the like resources get of the world really, or like you know, oh, all the world. Um, in Silicon Valley, where all the um, intelligent people end up flocking to in some way or form, yeah, where they're putting the energy is not in like how do we feed humans for the best health. It's how do we feed them plant-based meat or lab-grown meat. And like, Wait, babe, I, I, I still talk to people that are relatively well educated on health, and okay. it's a shock to them that every wide, widely, uh, widely used plant-based meat is far worse than, for you than meat, and is not a product that I would ever, in any circumstances, consider. Wait, meat like, is a health food. Yeah, yeah. it's a superfood. You'll, you'll mm. like this. Uh, we were over at uh, my buddy's restaurant today, and we're working on a. Uh, like a fast food concept that's regenerative beef plus seed oil free like french fries so it's oh, like, let's go yeah you told like me about this was, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. so anyways like it's a, it'll finally be like a place where you can go have the same food that american culture is known for but actually indulge in it in a sustainable way um in a way that's good for you it's better for the planet um 
and because uh, it has to check like a bunch of different boxes to actually work as a as a business. So yeah, no, it's wild. The pendulum is swinging back hard though, and we're we're riding on it. This is great. Dude, this is the this is great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the world I want to live in. You know, when I, my entire premise is this is like I don't want to live in a world where I'm feeding my kids things that, are, you know, as conscious beings, feeding basically dead inanimate matter. You know, yeah. going in a lab or like whatever have you. Right. Like, at least plants are alive. Yeah. You know, and if they have to be vegetarian, that's okay. But I mean, this is stuff that's like never seen the light of the sun. And then yeah. all of a sudden, you know, in like you know the, the best.